Right, what I'm talking about today is the rise of the experimental method in psychology. I've already given a lecture on Wundt, who is often heralded to be the father of experimental psychology. But what I want to suggest in this lecture is it wasn't quite so simple. It wasn't just Wundt ex invented the experiment and suddenly all psychologists became experimentalists. It wasn't like that at all. And I'll be looking at the argument of a very notable historian of psychology, Kurt Danziger, whose book, there's two books, Naming the Subject and uh, Constructing the Subject, are both on the reading list. <coughs> and basically the story which I'll be telling is a story which Danziger tells, is that Wundt invented a particular way of doing experiments but his way of doing experiments didn't persist. It suddenly was overtaken by a new way of doing experiments which used Galtonian statistics and Galtonian methods. And this gave rise to a rise of a sort of experiment which you've all been taught about, especially if you did A-level psychology. A rather artificial sort of experiment, but which you're told this is the way to do science. But we'll see that it's rather artificial. This was a grubby one. Anyway. Now, in the 20th century, but I shall be talking first of all about the 19th century, in the 20th century you saw the establishment of the experimental method. And this is the method which you're all familiar with. And many of you will use next year in your projects. Even if you just don't do, even if you don't do a formal laboratory experiment, if you do a questionnaire study, you'll probably use the same basic method as an experiment. And some even define psychology as a science because it used this method. <coughs> Remember that first discussion about psychology as a science, and then you all, from your discussion groups, you reported what you've been talking about, and a number of the groups said, yes, psychology is a science because it uses experiments. And very few of you defined what you meant by an experiment, and it was the sort of experiment which I'm going to be talking about which indeed is not the sort of experiment used in a lot of other sciences. And it wasn't the sort of experiment invented by Wundt. So what is the typical laboratory experiment? Now, you could all tell me, but I'll just go over some of the features. The typical laboratory experiment is you have at least two groups. <coughs> Often it's an experimental group and a control group control group, which is just people ordinarily interacting in a particular situation, the experimental group, they have to do something very particular, which the experimentalist has set up, you, and you compare them. And basically the subjects are tested under identical conditions, except for one variable, which is either a situational variable or a subject variable. So. Groups of people come to the laboratory, they're assigned to be in this group or that group, the experimental group or the control group. The experimental group does exactly the same as the control group except for one thing. And if there's a difference in responses, you say it's that one thing which has caused that difference. Or they do identical things but the subjects are different. In one group there's people over the age of 65 and in the other group it's under the age of 65 and if they do they behave differently you say ah it's 65 that's what makes the difference <clears throat> you all recognize that were you all taught have you all been taught to do experiments like this design studies like this have you have you no, good you recognize it 
And then, <clears throat> when you've got your results, what do you do? You do statistics. You've all studied statistics for almost two years here at university. I asked last week, did anyone like statistics? No one's arm shot up in the air. You don't like it. But you know you have to do it. And why you have to do it to be scientific. Is this what you've been told? Why have you been told you must do statistics, which none of you want to do? Why? Evidence. Sorry? Evidence. Evidence. Why? To test the hypothesis. To test the hypothesis. You need the statistics to do psychology properly. Is this what you've been told? Well, have any of you questioned that? Let's carry on. <coughs> and if you do your experiments, when you do your projects, <sighs> you've been told you have to recruit participants. Have you been told that? You've got a nice idea for a study, you have to go out and get participants, and a sufficient number of them. Is this familiar to you? Yes? <coughs> I'm not talking about stuff which is unfamiliar. And does it seem obvious that the participants you recruit are not yourself? You as experimenters are not looking at yourselves, you're looking at other people. Right? And you probably haven't even been told that. You've just assumed that is the way to be scientific. Right? Has anyone said, do your experiments on yourself? Or have they said, go out and pester people in the streets of Loughborough <laughs> or in the Students' Union or whatever? It's pestering, isn't it? Oh, God, you're sleepy today. <laughs> I don't want to be telling you things which aren't true. Is it, does this match what you've been told how to do scientific psychological research? Yeah. Yes. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, oh, you've got voices. And then there are critics of the standard experiment. Some of the critics say, oh, this is rather bad, this is rather bad, because you put a distance between the experimenters who are giving instructions and the participants who are there just meekly obeying orders. Fill out this questionnaire, answer my questions, press this button, and so on. Is that the way to study human behaviour, by getting people to fulfil orders? And that the experiment above all is a social situation. You can't do experiments on people unless you ask people to do things or tell them to do things. And within the social situation, you see the exercise of power. This is what the critics say. The experimenter giving orders. The respondent saying, oh yes, yes, I'll press this button. Oh yes, I'll press that button and so on. Is this the way to study people, putting them in a position to give orders? And the scientist treats the experimental subject almost like an object. I've got to get ten participants, and I tra translate what they do into numerical data. I'm not interested in the people, I just want boxes to tick, to be ticked. I just want data points. And when you come to write up your reports, you've probably even done some practical reports already. And if you're doing a statistically based experiment or study, do you list the names of all the people who've taken part and their addresses and describe them? Or do you just say, 10 participants filled up my questionnaire or press the buttons I told them to press? Which? The second one. The second one. You're told you don't put their names in. 
You don't even have to know their names, do you? Experimental reports are anonymous. And the critics say, this is all dehumanising. Dehumanises people. Is this the best way to study hum human nature? By dehumanising people? Now, the term subject is still used, although often people tell you about participants. And some critics are saying, it is. It's like a metaphor. You, psychologists using the term subject, because historically the term subject came from anatomy and was what an anatomist called dead bodies. Oh, the subject had been dead <coughs> for 24 hours when we cut open its stomach or something like that. And isn't that dehumanising? Well, those are the critics. But the critics, by and large, are, are often not historical. There's a much more powerful argument against the current ways of doing things, which, if you have a historical perspective, you can make. Let's ask the question, where did the current model of what counts as a scientific experiment in psychology, a scientific study, where did this model come from? How did it occur? Now, when you're told this is the way to do psychology, particularly when you, I, I expect a majority of you studied psychology at A level, and particularly you were just told this is what you do. You say, yes, how interesting. I didn't choose to do psychology because I was interested in people. Oh, perish for thought. No, I wanted to do psychology because I was interested in statistically examining the responses of subjects. Ha. Ah. Now, you don't find this model of doing studies of the mind of human beings in the 18th century, in the 1700s. You don't find it at all. You don't find it in in the start of the 1800s, or in the middle of the 1800s. Darwin, for instance, his study of his own children. They're of individuals. They're not anonymous. It's very personal. You know who he's writing about. Does that make Darwin not a scientist? No statistics. No numbers. Descriptions of what his daughter, what his son could do. <coughs> Galton. Galton is where the mania for statistics starts. And the origin of using large scale songs, aggregate data. I've got that round the wrong way. Galton as the origin of using aggregate data. It's not aggregate data as origin. No, it could be aggregate data as the origin of the study. But no, it doesn't work that way. Shh, don't tell people who haven't come that I've got that the wrong way round. They'll be misled and you'll all be rewarded for attending. Don't quote me on that. I'm not serious. But... You've heard me talk about Vont, the father of a modern experiment. And as I said, go to many of the textbooks, not Danziger, but the standard, particularly American textbooks, on the history of psychology, and they'll tell you Vont invented the modern psychological experiment. And but what he did in Leipzig, in his laboratory, with his new, brand new, sparkling, bronze psychological equipment, what he did there was the, was the modern psychological experiment. Except for one thing. It wasn't. It was a very different sort of experiment. <laughs> 
Often you had two people, an experimenter and an observer. Not an experimenter and a subject would describe an experimenter and an observer. Now, I've described some of Wundt's classic experiments of, about whether someone could differentiate between two weights of almost the same, or two lights of almost the same brightness. What did the experimenter do? The experimenter manipulated the equipment, or the experimenter put the weight in the hand, turned up the brightness, or turned down the brightness, made the sound come out of the bed of equipment. The experimenter manipulated the equipment and gave the other person the thing to hold or to judge. OK, that's what the experimenter did. And you say, well, yeah, that's what a modern experimenter does if they're studying vision, for instance. And the other person wasn't called the subject, but was called the observer. Because the other person had to observe what effect the experimenter was having. The experimenter puts something gentle in your hand. And the other person observes what is the effect by paying attention to their hand, to their feelings. And then they report, yes, I did feel something. Yes, that light was a bit brighter. The observer observes the stimulus and observes their own reaction. Surely this is just the same as the subject. But, for one big thing, the observer and the experimenter were often colleagues. And they'd often swap roles. But that sometimes the one who'd been fiddling with the equipment would say, Oh, I'll go and now observe. You, you, you go and twiddle the knobs on the equipment. You, you haven't been told to do this, have you? You get someone from off from the street, one of you, you recruit a participant, and you get them to administer, administer the, the experiment? No. And the observer was often named in the early reports. More than this, the observer would often be the author of the reports. In modern parlance, we'd say the subject wrote the report. And who had the high status? The person fiddling with the equipment? Or the person saying, yes, I can feel that. It normally was the latter. The observer was often the person with the high status. Wundt would often act as the observer, what we would call the experimental subject, for his own students. They would be honored if the great Professor, Doctor, Doctor Wundt would come in and say, put this on my hand, shine the light in my eyes, and I will tell you whether I can detect a difference. Oh, yes, Professor Wundt. And why? Because Wundt and his students, and those who followed him, <coughs> assumed that being the observer, being the experimental subject involved great <coughs> skill and practice. It needed skill to observe the light and detect whether you could see a slight difference or not. It didn't take much skill to fiddle about with the equipment. Being the experimenter wasn't the big skill. It was being the observer in these early experiments was the big skill. Now, can you see a difference?
here in these early experiments from what you've been told is the way to do experiments and the proper scientific way. Can you see? It's all back to front. Yes? Yeah. My goodness, we're sleepy today. Yes, it is. And isn't this surprising that this is the man who was considered the father of experimentation, does things back to front? And the method, as always, the method in psychology affects the nature of the psychology which is produced. You use a particular sort of method and you get a particular sort of data and you get a particular sort of way of looking at us, the human beings. Those early experiments often involved just looking at one person, maybe two people, if they observe an experiment to swap roles. They were often reports of a single case. The study would report one person, one observer, looking at their reactions, reporting their reactions, their observations, under a number of different circumstances. And the data was the individual's responses. It wasn't aggregate data. It wasn't you get 10 subjects and you add it together and then you divide by 10 to get the aggregate mean response. These early experiments plotted, said, when, I sh when we shone a light of this intensity, the person said they could see it. And, and when we increased the intensity by a, a tenth, they reported they could see that increase. And so you could plot the levels of what you showed and the levels of what you were observed for an individual respondent. And Wundt and his chums, his students, assumed often that they were looking at universal processes. They didn't say, oh, Professor Wundt, because his brain is even bigger than Leipzig Cathedral, but he doesn't represent every anybody. They would say, no, no, this is how, this is how people observe small changes in lives. And they weren't particularly interested in individual differences. Did Professor Wundt uh, get a different range of response than his best students. Now, individual differences weren't so important. And now here is the point. There is no intrinsic reason for thinking the one type of experiment is unscientific. <coughs> it may be different from the experiments where used to, but I don't think that anyone has produced a convincing reason why you should call it unscientific. It's controlled, it looks at an individual, it plots responses, but there is nothing in the canon of science which says you can't examine yourself or that you need 12 respondents, or that you need statistics. If you said you need statistics, then you'll wipe out practically all of physics, and certainly Darwin. You say, oh, Darwin wasn't scientific. If Darwin wasn't scientific, who the heck was? Okay, but this isn't the modern experiment. While Wolf was developing his experiments, there was old Francis Galton striding through 
towns of England. They'd given up striding through the, uh, the empire. And Galton, his way of doing research, nobody considered it I'm doing research, was to observe others, not himself. Because remember, he was obsessed with the idea that the unfit were breeding. To show this, he needed to study the unfit, to show that there are differences between the fit and the unfit. He couldn't study himself to get data on the unfit. Well, he could, I think. <laughs> he didn't think he could. And for him, he wanted to have comparisons. Comparisons of groups, superior groups, inferior groups, individuals, comparisons, superior individuals, inferior individuals. He wasn't really interested in individual processes in the way in which he thought us. Again, do you understand the difference? Like his study of the eminent people, comparing really eminent with just moderately eminent, who had the most eminent relatives? And did the eminent people have more eminent close relatives than distant relatives? always comparisons between different groups. He did tests of thinking and visual imagery. He believed at one time that those with the superior brains like his brain. And he had rather a large head, it seems, from the photographs. Would be able to be good at conceptual thinking and also good at visual imaging. And he compared good thinkers with poor thinkers and wanted to see whether the good thinkers reported more visual images than the bad thinkers, the, the, uh, the poor thinkers. Actually, he found it was the reverse. The good thinkers reported less visual imagery Oh, did this mean that the, good, the bad thinkers actually were quite good thinkers? No, no, no. Galton, as a scientist, wasn't going to give up his favourite hypothesis. He said, no, no, no. Uh, uh, the bad thinkers have to think in visual imagery because they're no good at conceptual thinking. And so uh, visual imagery became a sign of poor thinking and what you would expect amongst term quite without embarrassment about amongst the savages and the lower races and the poor. Ah, this is science. That is irony. Don't cross it down. Now I've described Wundt's type of experiment and you'll see it's very the very opposite from something Galton did where he got so much statistically pliable data. It, he set up what he called the anthropometric laboratory. And that means anthropometric means measuring man. Not, not men, but man. And he set this laboratory up at an international health exhibition, a big exhibition in London, in 1884. <coughs> the people who came to go to the anthropometric laboratory, and then Galt, not Galton, but his paid assistants, would measure the people and weigh them, measure their height, their weight, measure their reaction time, you know, get them to respond to something, their strength. Their perception, colour perception, could they perceive? Did they have good eyesight? Could they perceive small changes in colour? Their punching power, how strong were they at 
punching things. All this he put into uh, uh, numerical data. More than 10,000 subjects took part and they enjoyed it. Nothing like this had ever been done before, measuring ordinary people. Don't forget, this is for days long, long before the National Health Service. Most people didn't see doctors. A massive amount of data, including much of it physical, but also some psychological data. And of course, he then analysed it. But you can see here something which looks much more like the modern study but contains a lot of differences. Say, from Wundt, it's a perfunctory relationship between the person running the experiment and the person taking part in it. It's the giving of orders, punch this weight, uh, lift up this thing, put out your arm and we'll measure it. Not colleagues like Wundt, and his students, one collaborating to be the observer and one the experimenter. These subjects weren't part of the research process. The research process was done by some superior person. And what is important is that the individual's measurement really have meaning in relation to the measurements taken from other individuals. Supposing you get the score, and people who get the score, they wanted to know their scores at the anthropometric la laboratory, but your reaction time was uh, two seconds. If you're just told your reaction time is two seconds, it means bugger all to you. But if you're told your reaction time of two seconds is a lot quicker than most other people's, then you go out thinking, oh, aren't I wonderful? Oh, isn't that good? I have such talent. The Wundt's experiment, the meaningfulness of whether you could detect one light over another light, doesn't depend on a comparison with other people for its meaningfulness. The Galtonian data did. And Galton was interested in correlations between measurements. <coughs> because, by and large, he thought that physical prowess was related to mental prowess. Those who were, had superior intellects would have superior bodies. Remember when he lived a time of great poverty. This is, you would just predict this. Those who had education because they were middle class or upper class would also have better diets than those who had no education, who left school at 12 or 13 and worked as chimney sweeps taken into domestic service with a life expectancy of mid-30s to 40s, and height small. So it's no surprise he found those correlations. And he was interested in making correlations not just between arm length and uh, 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 perceptual acuity or intellectual ability, but also looking at differences between groups, men and women. Oh, he was interested which had the, the, better, the better brains. Oh, men, his study showed. Biological groups, which had the better brains and the bigger bodies and the healthier bodies. Europeans or Africans, oh, his studies revealed. And of course, he always interpreted his results as if it was unchanging biology.
although he was using statistics, although he was using numerical data, this was not the modern experiment. And would anyone want to say why it wasn't the modern experiment? No. No. You want me to? What if I don't? Oh, I will. I will. I'm soft like that. Because there was no intervention. There was no setting up of the situation. There was no experimental and control group. <coughs> there were no psychological tests as such, no IQ tests. And above all, no experimental interventions. And there's a little interesting side note. For the modern experiment, if you take up a lot of someone's time, you may pay them. Of course, for your projects, your third year project, you haven't got the funds to pay your subjects. Now, in Gordon's anthropometric laboratory, the cheek of him, the subjects paid him. <laughs> And I thought it was wonderful getting all this data, all this information about themselves. Don't think you can get away with this in your third year, but you can set up a subject, and, uh, uh, an experiment, and everyone will pay to collaborate. The time has passed for that. But Galton was showing the way towards the modern experiment without payment of subjects. Danziger, in his book, looked at the psychology journals of the United States and Germany, this long period of time, from when Wundt was in his heyday to the 1930s when Wundt was long dead. And what he was interested in is what sort of experiments were being published. And if we compare, and he was comparing the Wundt type experiment with the modern experiment, which took many of the procedures and certainly the statistics from Goldman. And this is the period when psychology became institutional. Where more and more journals were developed, where degrees in psychology started springing up throughout uh, Europe and Amer the Americas. And Wundt, his students, started travelling to the United States, to South America, and setting up laboratories as well. In the 1890s, everyone wanted a student of Wundt. Ah, oh, you'll be a proper scientific experimentalist. And what Danziger found is up until 1912, two years before the First World War, most of the experiments published in the, the psychological journals, whether in the United States or in Germany, were Wundt type experiments with the exchange between the experimenter and the <coughs> subject. It's a deliberate mistake, it should be observer. And with the subjects of what we now call the subjects named. Oh, Professor Wundt, or Professor Munsterberg, or Professor Cooper was the observer in my experiment. And this was particularly true in Germany. In the applied journals, this wasn't so true. Not so many Wundt-type experiments in the applied journals. The applied journals, like journals of education, were often compare studies comparing 
the poor with the not so poor. And the uh, uh, poor school children with the not so poor school children. And so they were a different sort of study. But before the First World War, this is what Danziger says. In virtually all published studies, the experimental results were clearly attributed to individual experimental subjects. Most often, <coughs> the individuals concerned were identified by a name, a letter, or by initials. They could be identified. If you said the observer was WW, you'll say, oh, I don't know who WW is. You'll be a pretty poor psychologist if, if in those days you didn't know who WW was. I expect you all could tell me now, 100 years later, who was WW? Uh, 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 was it Wilhelm Wundt? <laughs> misery, misery, misery. After 1912, a decline in the Wundt-type experiment in the journals. Virtually disappearing, especially in the United States, and the rise of anonymous subjects. 25 subjects were recruited in the control group and 26 in the experimental group didn't have their initials. And more was changing than just the style of reporting who were the participants. There was a theoretical change. Uh, uh, the pattern of experimentation, like the pattern of thinking. It's a mistake! It's a spelling mistake! It should be bloody pattern of experimentation was changing. <laughs> Don't tell those who are not here. <laughs> tell them, yes, he did talk about pitter patter of experimentation. <laughs> He's mad. <laughs> the Wundt experiment, the pattern was of individual respondents. Individual responses. <clears throat> and. <clears throat> Another mistake. That should be variations were intra-individual, not inter. Intra is within, not between. <gasps> oh dear. If I didn't know I was teetotal, I would think I was drunk when I did this. <laughs> oh. It was how the individual, the same person, responds to different stimuli. And, different, and maybe the same stimuli. And very seldom using statistics, but if they did use statistics, occasionally they did, it was comparing what one person did in one situation with what the same person did in another situation. It wasn't these big groups of people. That was what Wundt's style. <coughs> and the new type of experiment was using groups, not individuals. And we see the rise of aggregate data. Aggregate data is where you get data normally from more than one person and you lump it all together. You combine it. And uh, Danziger gave the results from the American Journal of Psychology, the Psychological Monographs, Journal of Experimental Psychology, all very early and respected American journals of psychology. And before 1912, which seems to have been a cut-off point, only about 30% of the studies reported group data. By 1951, the figure was 80%. And the, the other 20% weren't 
full-type studies. They actually were behaviourist studies. Behaviourist, uh, not looking at experience, but looking at how one rat might have behaved to a particular schedule of reinforcement. But by 1951, most studies reported group data. A massive decline of studies with individual data. We can ask, what is the significance of the change? Well, Danzig just said the change led to an interest in two different sorts of group. First of all, there were studies which used <coughs> naturally occurring groups, like comparing males and females, middle class, working class, Americans, Europeans. Um, or occupational group. It took groups which exist in the world outside the laboratory and compares them. And this was used in applied studies. Journals of educational psychology, for instance wanted to see how children taught under this syllabus <coughs> fared with children taught under this syllabus. Children of immigrant parents versus children of native parents, and so on. The groups exist, and Danziger made a very important point that those who paid for the research often wanted studies like this. Government agencies, advertisers, and so on. This sort of study is marketable. Not this sort of study is more scientific. It's marketable. People will pay for it. And then there's the artificial groups. Not the naturally occurring groups, but the groups created by the experimenter. We had two groups of subjects, an experimental group and a control group. The control group we gave this questionnaire to. The experimental group we gave that questionnaire to. The experimenter has created those two groups. In fact, the experimenter assumes that those who go into one group are just as identical to those who go into the other group. And the experimenter creates the group distinction. And what Danziger says, the modern experiment gave rise to this artificial group, artificial group created by the experimenter. And then the experimenter, whether using artificial groups or naturally occurring groups, will present aggregate data. We've all been told this. Give the mean scores for group one and the mean scores for group two. And then they statistically analyze the aggregate differences. But notice one thing. When you give the mean score, for a group. The score which you take as the mean score to represent the group need not be a score which any member of that group actually scored. Supposing we took the weight of the class. We got you all to stand on a pair of scales <coughs> and we got the weight <coughs> and we, we added all the weights up together and divided by the number of people in the class and got the average weight, I would make a, a prediction that no one would actually have the same weight as the average weight. Not precisely. And this happens again and again in laboratory experiments. We have a presupposition 
that the average somehow is real, but it may not represent anything which any particular individual does. It's rather like saying that the average Briton has 2.75 children. I have never met anyone who has 2.75 children. And here is the paradox. And in some ways, with the growth of a modern experiment, which takes the statistics from Galton, takes the experimental control from Wundt, and then adds do, uh, uh, experimental groups. <coughs> but what is heralded as being scientific is in one sense less real. Because the experimentalists seem not so much interested in the, the people taking part in the experiment, who they keep at a distance, but they're even not interested in the individual scores of the participants. It's always the group average. And the group average may be an unreal score, may be a fictional score. And so the more scientific, apparently, you get, there's a case for saying the less real the subject matter. But what we've seen in the development of a modern experiment is a triumph over Wundt, a triumph over Wundt's more collaborative way of doing it. And the more triumphant the modern experiment has, has become, the more the scientists forget the origins of the experiment. You who've done A-level psychology will have been told, yes, this is the scientific way. This is the way psychologists do. And you forget that one of the great psychologists in the early times did a very the one who founded the experimental psychology did a different sort of experiment. And the other great psychologist who I talked about, William James, whose book, The Principles of Psychology, is the best, most widely read textbook there's ever been, was even disparaging about Wilhelm Wundt's sort of experiments, as if it, those experiments didn't really get to the essence of psychology. And there's something else which is an absence. Always look, if you want to understand anything, I'm not saying even just about psychology, anything in the world. If you want to understand something or in the social world, try to look for what isn't said as much as what is said. And in this story, about the modern psychological experiment and funds. What isn't said? What isn't being said? Something very, very simple. No one is saying that the modern experimentalists proved that the way Wundt did his experiments was wrong or was unscientific. Remember, right at the start of the course, I talked about the problem of why psychological theories rise and why they fall. Was it a matter because of refutation, that someone refutes a theory, someone refutes a methodology, a way of doing psychology? Well, no one has refuted that, as far as I know. It's just, it fell out of fashion. Those who were providing funds for research didn't want to provide funds for the full sort of study. And this is the curiousness, the curiosity, 
of psychology and its history. But if you look carefully in the history, you realise some of the assumptions which you're told, and which you're taught, and which you will accept, just don't fit the historical record. 